in this episode, we're going to be talking or tackling a tough topic that's been making headlines, harassment and anti-discrimination policies in the indie game industry, pretty much in the game industry as a whole. Now, we'll explore how those policies and sometimes lack thereof is going to impact the developers and what changes are being called for to create a safer work environment. Now, but that's not all. The indie scene is also facing another challenger, layoffs and studio closures, just recently, since today, or today, I should say. It's a uh, turbulent time for many talented creators who find themselves without a job, often with little, no, without little or no warning, and I'm going to discuss what's causing these such shutdowns and how they're affecting the community. I think one guess, and it's you know, funny. So... Grab your headphones and get ready for another insightful discussion. Whether you're a gamer, a developer, or just someone who cares about workplace fairness, this episode is for you. So let's press start on this important conversation. Now, let's actually dive deep into it. Because I, I, the reason why I brought this up with the discrimination, workplace harassment, safety, and all that sort of stuff. I saw this article. What was it? It was way back a couple days ago, back on May 2nd. And one of those things is that it was brought to light that the International Game Developers Association released its 2023 Developer Satisfaction Survey on that day. So let me go ahead, bring it over onto this right here. So you can see the article as well. If you're audio listeners, I'm gonna go ahead and read off most of it or take the points that are most important and we'll discuss about that as well. So if you're audio listening, you'll understand. Be right along with us. So like I said, I already read that. Saw developers highlighting numerous issues, including equity, diversity, inclusions, layoffs, and crunch. Now, a lot of big part of this is that many, let's just say for large game studios, are what's called crunch. It's where they're pretty much saying, hey, our game is in a state of, of disarray, or not disarray, but it's in a state of we are getting close to our launch window, our launch date, and we are not ready. So we're going to be spending the next weeks, seven days a week, m- like more hours than you are expecting to work to get to a point where our game is actually finished and on time and ready to go. Now, is this a good thing? No, not really, because when you're forcing or... You're pressuring your developers and your employees to a certain rate that they're not getting enough sleep. Focus is all over the place or not even or non-existent. Your product is just going to get more and more crap. <laughs> it's not really any way to go about doing things like this because it's just going to burn out the people that you have. And then once you burn them out so much, they're going to leave and just, or even get out of the industry altogether. That's just crunch. That's just one side of you know, game industry as a whole. And that's someone that is looking from the outside in. I'd have no experience within the game industry or making a game whatsoever. So this is just my two cents and how I see things. It's also data from the, the survey was collected between May 17th and October 20th. 2023 and included responses from 777 game makers. I don't know if that's what they were going for, but that's a very coincidental number of game makers of getting seven triple sevens. That's a jackpot. So yeah. (laughs) So 43% of developers felt that policies on general non-discrimination, equal opportunity, hiring and sexual harassment were adequately enforced. But 28% of those surveyed reported that their workplace had no equality, diversity, and inclusion programs, while 38% of workplaces had a formal complaint procedure for those issues in place. Now, that's the thing. is a lot of people, or I should say a lot of companies, especially large scale, we're talking like Activision, Blizzard, does the even smaller ones, like Ubi, no, I wouldn't say Ubisoft, but Funcom. And what's another one? Coffee Stain. Pretty much any game developer, game publisher company is going to have some issues, whether because they have the the foresight to 
say, okay, we need to have make sure we are including enough diversification because if we hire just all straight white guys and our games are going to be not really good at all. They're going to be the absolute worst because we don't, or we're not pulling enough diversity, enough information, enough cultural influence from these other side of, of the coin from hiring people of color, Hispanic, everything else that you can think of. Those cultures, those influences of those cultures are not going to make a influence into your game in one way or the other. And that's the thing that we really have seen back in, what was it, the early 80s, 90s, where it was pretty much most of the games were one thing is this one muscle-bound dude going through and kicking the crap out of everything. And uh, yeah. Do you want more games like that? Yeah, sometimes it'd be pretty cool, but just have a little bit more variance with how our games are, are done. And the thing is that the workplace culture within most of these companies is not good, especially for the larger ones, because we have all seen the stories from, or actually read the stories from Blizzard Activision, Activision Blizzard, I should call them, since they're actually now underneath Microsoft. So it's like looking back at the pop, the Bobby Kotek era, just in that era of company and how things were being run and the stories were coming out of people were leaving because it was a completely hostile, toxic work environment for pretty much anyone that wasn't a straight white guy. Maybe even sometimes for them too, but that was a completely different situation. But the general gist of it is that the basics of this hostile work environment is very incon inconducive to actually producing a quality product for your customer base. And it's like the old, the old boys club that has been still systemic throughout the ages since I guess the dawn of time, I'm not really from the dawn of time, from the industrial revolution to now where you have a group of guys and then, uh, we'll, oh yeah, we'll just hire this lady because eh, we have to we just get the females into here. And it's, and it's just, it's really, we're 2024 and this is what we're still having to deal with and having to deal with half the developers are in the industry have become more diverse over the past years compared to 49% in 2021. But while 67% of those surveyed felt that there was not enough equal treatment and opportunity, 67% of the surveyed of the 777 game makers felt that there was not enough equal treatment and opportunity. And here we are still at 2024 having to deal with this stuff that is probably a holdover for past, what, 50, 60, 80, 100 years. And it's ridiculous that we're having to deal with this still. And we'll probably still have to deal with this for the next couple decades. It's something that if you are a developer, you're making a small team, one of the things that I know there are a lot of small developer, indie developers out there that are focused on the uh, DEI side of things. They're looking, they're probably uh, a group of friends or a group of people that know each other that are part of, uh, you know, the LGBTQ or they're Hispanic or the black community or wh whoever. It's one of the things is that we got to, we have to do better. And one of the things is that it also helps out our games. Our games are pretty much like a snapshot into a cultural snapshot of what's been going on. And it reflects on the, the developer, the person who's actually making it, and the story that they want to tell to get out there and for people to experience a little bit wrapped around whatever their game is to be made. So that's the thing that we really have to work on and figure out how we're going to get past this. So now let's actually move on to studio layoffs, which is also impacts with 
what's been going on with the, the survey. Because in here it says also, it has also provided insight into the recent wave of layoffs, which found that 10,500 jobs have been lost over 2023. 4.8% of developers said they were currently unemployed. Now, if we saw the news today, Xbox decided to close some studios and lay off uh, a couple people. This one is also back from May 2nd. This one was Take Two is also reportedly shutting down Roll 7 and Intercept Games. Private Division suffers layoffs. We've been seeing so many freaking layoffs over just the past couple months, uh, pretty much the past year, that it's ridiculous is that the executive branch of a lot of these companies are not thinking long term. Let's take a look at the example of the let's pull it up here. Hi-Fi Rush it helps if I also have the right keyboard. I'll go down to the verge here. So yeah, because Microsoft shuts down Bethesda Studios behind Redfall and Hi-Fi Rush. Hi-Fi Rush was made by Tango. Was it Tango GameWorks? Now, if we look at it, Tango, the the people at Tango when they made a Hi-Fi Rush, it was like it was a huge success in the grand scheme of things for a lot of people. Uh, what was it? It wasn't the Game Awards, was it? When it was really, uh, announced that it was available now, I'm talking about like months ago, but it was it saw great success from. People downloading it, loving it, enjoying the game, and wanting more of it. Fortunately, I don't know what is going through Microsoft's you know, brain to shut down a game studio that has produced a Xbox exclusive game that has been doing great. It's been years since the last time they actually had a, a game do so well that was an exclusive. I don't know. <laughs> really, I don't know what they what they were thinking of. Now, with Redfall, with Arcane Austin, I can see because Redfall was pushed out too soon. It was completely half-baked. They should have spent some, another six to nine months making a game better or imp trying to improve it even more. But unfortunately... The higher ups saw that our, we've already pushed it back enough. We need to push it out now. We need to release the game in its current state. And in its current state, it was not good enough. And of course, the gamers, the people who played it, let them know. It's like, hey, Redfall is not good at all. Sorry. And it's been very, it's been tanking for quite some time since its release. And with, what was it, this reading through here. Yeah, the Redfall developer Arcane will close with some members of the team joining other studios to work on projects across Bethesda. It's at the game studio, Xbox Game Studios, Matt Booty. It's a great name. I love that name. Redfall's previous update will be its last as Microsoft is ending all development on the game. Servers will remain online for players to enjoy, and we will provide make good offers to players who purchase the Hero DLC. Now, most of you probably know if you know me for a while, I have I constantly harp on really not to jump on the pre-orders or the yeah the pre-orders with this extra game bundle stuff that you can purchase for hundreds of dollars. Here is a perfect example of a game studio and the game itself. Not really, I'm saying this because I know exactly what will happen next year. The game servers will be shut down because we've seen it already with Ubisoft, with the crew shutting down those servers. I'm sure that the crew two or the crew three is the latest one that more than likely they'll shut down the servers in, in the not so near future. But we see these developers, these game publishers that are making a online game that really, once they turn off the servers, the game is gone. There's no going back. There's no saving it. There is no way to archive the game. It's pretty much as soon as they turn off the servers, it is lost to lost to the annuals of time. And I know with the uh, game Redfall, because there's a multiplayer aspect to it, that you can invite your friends. But there's also a single player mode. And unfortunately, what I, I uh, 
know is that I saw a article just saw it before going live is that the developers were just about finishing up an offline mode when they got the news that they're being let go. That sucks. I would like to play the games eventually. I did play the game when it first came out and it was fine. It wasn't this grand spectacle of gotta play it. It was a decent game for the little bit that I actually played of it. Yeah. It's one of those things where this, the C-suite of these studios and the publishers are not really looking long-term. All they care about is making sure that the line continues to go up every quarter, no matter what. And I, I talked this bit offline <laughs> with my uh, significant other that just to go off the rails here with Amazon and wanting to in, put in a pause prime video content, you'll get served with ads. And that's the thing is we're already dealing with ads and that's all they can think about is squeezing the customer for as much money as humanly possible. And it's just, it's a, it's a, it's not going to, it's not going to continue to, to work. There's going to become a line where normal everyday consumers are going to say enough's enough. We are tired of you bleeding us dry for every little bit. You have squeezed that stone for as much drop of blood as you can possibly get. And there is no more. We're done. We are leaving to the high, the high seas. And if you don't like it, too bad. Is you will have only yourself to blame. That's just my little rant. That was a little aside. <laughs> I'm trying to look at different things and see that the tech industry, pretty much all of industry and in, corporate late stage capitalism is not a sustain, sustainable market. It will eventually bleed itself out and die, wither and die. And the uh, C-suite people, yeah, you might have millions of dollars, but you're not going to have those millions of dollars that much when the people rise up. But we shall see if that ever happens. And it's something that hopefully it does happen at one, one point or another. Now, speaking of money, we all know that where games have been going is somewhere that is not really where we like to see it go. We have seen... In this article from Game Industry Biz, Biz, all the articles I've been looking at tonight are from Game Industry Biz. I'll have the links in the description down below in the edited version. But live services, script, subscriptions, and free-to-play are a new reality for consoles and gaming. So as a PC gamer, I know we've already been hit long ago with the multi-transactions, the battle passes, the games as a service live service games, and we've seen the failures of a few of those, especially, was it Marvel's, the Avengers game, killed the, the Justice, no, Suicide Squad, killed the Justice League, how live service games are not really, especially if you're not designing the game to be like that from the get-go, we can tell it's been shoehorned in, and when you're trying to just shove this this microtransactional stuff into a game, that shouldn't have been there. But it's, you're you're also getting it on consoles here too. So, the console gaming software and services market is arguably the most dynamic part of the game sector in terms of business models. No one business model dominates console gaming in 2024, and over the next few years, Ampere's outlook for the monetization dynamics across console remain largely similar with in-game subscriptions and premium monetization all playing a significant role. So a spend on in-game and DLC content has grown to become a central part of the market opportunity, yet like the PC gaming space, premium games are still important to the scale of the market. Now there's this graph here is actually a pretty uh, good telling of where the game publishers, developers mindset is going towards. For if you're listening to audio version, one line that has been steadily tracking downward over the past 10 years, since 2010 to future market of 2020, 2025 and 2026, 
is continually going down, and that is the premium full game physical. So what that means is a full game that you buy. More than likely, that means like Baldur's Gate. It's it sixty dollars or seventy dollars, and it's the complete game itself. There's really not any microtransactions. There is no in microtransactions. There's no DLC. It is the full game itself, start to finish. This is what you get. No more. The game. The lines that are continually going up are the ones that are, are in-game DLCs. That's they're rose sharply in like 2017 throughout the pandemic. It kind of dipped in last year or no, two years ago, 2022. And the same thing for subscription services has been steadily increasing. From 2019, it saw a sharp uptick, and it has been just riding that wave upwards ever since. And they have a few future projections are going to continue that way as well. So what are your thoughts on games as a service, live service games, microtransactions? Just just give us more money for cosmetics or whatnot. What are your thoughts on this whole situation of the microtransaction situation within games. And we're seeing less and less of the single player games, the full game itself coming out and more of the focus is on, like I said, monetization. So really, what are your thoughts? If you go ahead, leave your thoughts as a comment down below, that'd be much appreciated. And that's going to be it for this episode of the Indie Basement. Now, if you'd like to get in contact with me or join any, not, let me start again. If you'd like to join the Two Town Waffle community to listen or join talks on past episodes or basically just, you know, be part of the community, head over to twotownwaffle.com. We also have a weekly newsletter that comes out every Tuesday. It's completely free. It takes part of, takes apart the alternative platforms, any games, and Basically, a little bit of everything that is that we do here on Any Basement and Any Creator Podcast. So that's going to be it for me tonight. And I hope to see you next episode and enjoy your night. Later, taters.